appreciate you getting our hearts ready to go today as we dive into God's Word. We are in the fifth week of, the fifth and final week of a series that we started called Focus on the Fundamentals. We're diving into what the fundamentals are for our faith. Our first week we talked about our time uh, that we have and how we spend it and we redeem it. The second week we talked about how we dive into and when we dive into Scripture. Our third week was focused on our prayer life and last week we focused on serving and then this past week we actually went out and served which was great. Which is going to lead us to the final part of our of this of this set of messages, which is the circles that we have, the circles that we have both in church, outside of church, with our work, school, whatever it might be. And so the focus upon this is this verse right here, which is from Hebrews, which is chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. So it says this. So it says, "Let us consider." So right where you're just sitting right now, I just want, I want you to think about this. I want you to consider the words that the writer of Hebrews is going to share here. So let let us consider. We may spur one another on. On, or how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So, how is it that we spur each other on? And the word spur here literally means to urge. So, how is it that you urge people along in your life? How is it that you urge them on if you're a boss and, and that you deal with them whenever they're you, your workers? Or maybe they're just a co-worker. How is it you urge each other along when you know that life is hitting and you know that there's struggles, you know there's abandonment, you know that there's loneliness, you know there's despair, you know there's addiction, you know all these things that are happening within life. Consider for a second on how it is that you reach to someone and care for them. Does it focus on God? Does it focus on self? Does it focus on this world? So the writer says, so consider how you may spur them on toward love and good deeds. And the Bible tells us that God is love. So how is it that you point them in your life? How is it you point others to God? And it says the next thing, not giving up meeting together. Now this word giving up means this. It means deserting. The term means abandoning. And this is something that we are seeing taking place within the church now today. Is that people are abandoning their faith. They're abandoning this time of coming together because of so many things that are going on the outside. Because of so many influences that weren't there previously. Because of the busyness of life. In 1973, an amazing thing took place within this country that people didn't even see. They didn't even realize that it happened. But it used to be that one income could fulfill and supply for an entire household. But in 1973, that changed. There was a little bit of a recession, a, recession, a dip. Everyone panicked. They thought it was going to be like 1929 when the Great Depression hit. And so all of a sudden, a second income was needed. And so what took place from that is that all of a sudden, we have to continue to, to have the things that we have. So we've got to send a second person out there. And it started to split the family as we saw it and the families we knew it and we didn't even realize it people didn't even really start seeing it for another decade or so and everyone was working they were doing everything they could to keep food on the table and all those other kind of things but really what it ended up doing was started having a more of a materialistic side for extras and stuff and things which we all have but see that shift within our society caused us to go from things being open for five days to being open to six days and then being open for six days to being open for seven days. And things that we used to do that really mattered all of a sudden did become as important. And one of the main areas that that hit was church. So that the Sunday worship time, because while well, I work six days, I need to have the seventh day off. And the mindset changed. Because see, Sunday is the first day of the week. So we start this day together by bringing this time that we have together by focusing on God. But pe too many people see it as the end of the week. And because of that, they get lost. And they're like, oh, you know what? That's the end of my week. It's my time. I'm going to go ahead and just relax and do all those other kind of things. And because of the church has hurt, has been hurt greatly. They've deserted it. They've abandoned it. And it's easy to have happen. It can start with one week and then every other week and whatever it might be to the point now, and I've shared this with you before, that if you attend church one shot, once out of every six weeks in this country, you're now considered a regular churchgoer. But see, we need this time. We have to have this time together. So I want you to consider that today. I want you to consider why it is that you're here. And then I want you to consider what it is that you do with this time and the message that you're going to hear with the people that you have the opportunity to influence in your everyday life. These are the circles that we have. So, he's going to urge you on this for not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. So, there's an encouragement that takes place all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, if you notice with that, the day, the day is actually capitalized. There is a time, there's one prophecy that is left in the Bible for Jesus to fulfill. And that is the time for him to come back to get all of us. 
And it's coming. We don't know when it is, and none of us have any idea. But how we're living at the time, and how we choose to live every day, we are going to have to face at some point and some time. Whether it's, it just ends for us on this time that we have here on earth, or if Jesus comes back. How many of you have ever said, and I want you to be honest, man, I would just love it if Jesus would just come back today. I'm just great with Jesus coming back today. You know, my, my favorite team lost. Jesus, come back. Come back before the final, you know, whistle blows. You know, the, the people that are all getting ahead in front of us. Jesus, just come back. Just come back because I'll be gone and I don't have to deal with them anymore. And so what ends up happening is because of this time, and we know this day is approaching, instead of us looking forward to it and saying, oh my goodness, this gives me this opportunity to embrace this and to reach people and to care for them, we fall into complacency and procrastination and just kind of sitting back going, well, Jesus is going to come anyway, so what do I really need to do about that? Well, we need to spend our time right. We need to spend time in Scripture. We need to be praying. And we need to be serving. And we need to look at where it is that we are influencing. We need to urge one another on. Because, sadly, people are deserting this time that we have here together. The saddest part about all of this is that we all know that this is true. And yet, it continues to be true and we do little about it. See, the people that aren't here right now, the people that are closest to you, this is what they're suffering from, and every single number points to this. They're lonely, they're discouraged, and they have nothing but complete despair. They're basically out doing the things that they want to do, but the one thing that is missing the most is their time with others who are focused upon their faith. One of the things that I love to do whenever uh, Dan and I uh, go camp is I love to cook over a campfire. And what I, I like to do is I like to put all the, the charcoal in and, you know, get the thing ready to go and then watch the, the charcoals turn from black to gray so you, that way you know it's ready when it's time to cook. But every once in a while, one will get off its lit and get off on its own. And so as this pile continues to bring all the heat, the one that's off on its own, it slowly dies and it turns to ashes. The reason for that is because it needs one another to continue that heat to flow through the other ones and so we can get to that point of continuing to build that fire. So see, if we're not in here together and we're not learning about God's Word and we're not taking it out, what ends up setting forth for each one of us is we have that loneliness, we have that despair, and we have that discouragement. I'll share with you another area of life that we are seeing this every day and we just kind of take it for granted. The opioid, the opioid epidemic that has taken place, the reason, the main reason behind it comes down to loneliness. They did a study in U.S. News and World Report and they're finding out that almost half, almost half of everyone out there are suffering from loneliness, discouragement, and despair. And it's an alarming rate when it comes to younger people. And so what they have done and where they have gone is to opioids. Because they have been told and they believe and they've died for the fact that it will help them to soothe things and they'll be able to relax and they can put everything away. But what it really comes down to is the fact is that they're missing something even greater. This time that we have here together. And yeah, maybe we don't like how everything runs and maybe it's a struggle at times and you know, maybe they didn't sing the right song and you know, maybe I didn't use the right verse and sometimes the microphone goes out and, and we can all pick something, right? You know, we, the pumpkins we had aren't orange enough and our parking lot, people drive through it and it's like driving on the moon and all those other kind of things. But, but when we... Uh, you laugh about the parking lot because we all know it's true, right? All right. We'll take all the rest of the pumpkins and we'll fill them in the little holes. But, <laughs> but if that's what it becomes about, if that's what our focus is, we lose this time and this community of worship together, of which we great, greatly need. So I want to urge you today. I want, you to, I want to urge you to spur another believer on. Because there's people right now that are suffering from that loneliness and discouragement that aren't here. And they need to know that this time is worth it. Even when we sing the wrong words. Even when there's a misspelling. Even when we say something stupid, which is usually me. Even when those things happen. Even when Jason misses a scream. Even when we lose the audio. Whatever it might be. All those things are things that happen every single day. But this time together is needed. So that first area, that first circle that we need to focus upon is that time of worship. This is how it says it in Psalms 122. 
Psalm 122, it says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. See, this time that we come together should be an exciting time. It should be a moment where, oh good, I get to be with mom and dad, or I get to be with my brother and sister, I get to see family. And then outside of it, I'm going to see that lady who always says hi to me. I'm going to get to hug that guy that always takes time to give me a hug. I'm going to get a chance to sit on a pew and chat with some of my friends. I'm going to get you pick whatever it is that means the most to you. But we need to have this time of worship together. And if we're going to urge each other on, it should be something that we are looking forward to and within our different areas of influence that we can share with others so they can be a part of it as well. It's game changing. It's life changing. Urge others on. Urge yourself on. This is the first area that you shouldn't abandon in the most important circle within this because it leads to each circle after that. The next circle that we need to talk about is the circle of acceptance and grace. Because what will happen with us is we need to find an area in which we are accepted. And sadly, if we go back to the young people, they're finding areas that don't deal with God. They're finding areas that, such as the opioids. They're finding areas just to fill in the time. They're finding areas of, you know what, I know that all these people say the wrong words and they do the wrong things and they're trying drinking and they're smoking and they're vaping and all that, whatever it might be, but at least there I am accepted. And so we need to have a church that is loving and that will also be accepting. But at the same time, it will bring grace as opposed to guilt. Listen, we all have problems. We all have struggles. We all have things that we wish we wouldn't have done. We all have things we wish that we could change. But we can't change them if we're not giving them to God. And we can't find anyone next to us within this circle if we don't come together during this time of worship. So within that circle, we need to have that circle of acceptance and grace. Two of the most watched shows still to this day. The first one is Friends, and the theme song goes like this. I'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you like I've been there before. I'll be there for you because you've been there for me too. And people watch that. And here's the thing. They accepted one another. They accepted who the other person was. All of their dumb things that they say and all the dumb things that they did. And the next one is the office. People have to watch the office. Why? Because all of a sudden now, this is, this is the friend life. This is outside of it. You know, the only person that we even really know that had a job was Chandler. Well, Ross kind of had a job. He played with dinosaurs. And you had Chandler, but, but no one really knew what he did. And they came together at the coffee shop. And oh my goodness, this is life and this is grand. But then there's a the work side. And on the work side, it's like you have to deal with real people at times. But yet, we still go out and we'll quote things from friends and we'll say things from friends and we'll talk about it and then we'll look at, even like with The Office, oh, Michael Scott said, and we'll, I mean, we share these things. These are the most viewed shows. Why? Because within those, there was a time of acceptance. And even though they did a lot of dumb stuff, there was a time of grace and we all crave that. We all need that. Let's, let's, let's look at this verse here real quick. It says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to pick him up. I want to share this with you. This is what Robin Williams had said because of, of, of what had taken place in his life. He said, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. He said, it's not. He said, the worst thing in life is ending up with people who make you feel alone. See, Solomon saw this. And we don't think that Solomon saw this because he was the richest guy in the world and he had everything that you could imagine. He had women everywhere. He had all the riches. He was the wisest guy around. But at the end of the day, there was still a loneliness and a despair in him because all these people around him, he felt completely alone. And so he shares with us, and this is the verses that I use in weddings a lot of times because I want to remind them that you need one another. Husbands, we need our wives. Wives, we need our husbands. We're meant to walk side by side. But don't just go out and pick someone because you're like, oh, I have to have someone. God has someone in, 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 in store for you. Has that plan for that perfect someone in you. But here's the thing. The focus has to be on that third strand. And that third strand is really the first strand, which is God. 
At some point in some time within every wedding, we do something special. It could be a community candle. It could be a sand. One of my favorite ones that we're doing now is, the, is, a, is a rope. And it's actually braided together like a cross. And that third strand, they actually finish it together. And it becomes that cross, that, that braided cross together. And that third strand is really the first strand, which is God. Because in this life, the sad part is this, is that we can be amongst people and they can be all the way around us and we can be completely alone. Some people say it's because they don't get me. They don't understand me, but we don't even try to. So your circle of influence is very key when it comes to... I'm sorry, I said the circle of influence. Your circle of acceptance and uh, grace is very key, which is going to lead us to the third circle, and that is our circle of influence. See, an amazing thing took place probably about 10 or 15 years ago, is that we all of a sudden, the influencers that we have in our life... It used to be that we would say, okay, you know, it was popular with WWJD. Everyone had a, a bracelet. Everyone had a, you know, a, a shirts that they wore. Everyone talked about it. WWJD. But the influence changed because of social media. And now we look at actual influence, influencers out there, and advertisers realize just how important those influencers are. If I were to ask you, who is it that wrote the most Proverbs? Or who is it that wrote the most Psalms? Someone would say, David and Solomon. We could talk about those things. But as far as quoting them, it would be very difficult. So who is our modern day proverb writers? Well, number one has to be Taylor Swift. We laugh about it. And yet, if a song of hers comes on, even if you hate her, you, you know the words. You know, just uh, within the last ten years, the major one that was writing the Proverbs, it was Eminem. You know, and, and you may have bleeped out the words, but you knew, you knew them. You knew when Eminem came on. And if you didn't, trust me, your kid did or your grandchild knew, and they knew all about it. Those are the people that are influencing your kids and your grandkids. And they're influencing us whether we realize it or not. Taylor Swift is in a commercial right now, and she's just being fun, and she's shooting uh, whipped cream in her mouth and all those other kind of things. And they're like, oh my goodness, it's Taylor Swift, and it's, I think it has something to do with the credit card. They know that if Taylor Swift is on that, it's going to sell. They use the voices of the popular TV shows as the people that are on the microphone. And you're sitting there going, oh, I know that voice. I know the, oh, that's, that's Jim from The Office. That's, and, and we can fill it in. We know exactly who they are. Why? Because they know it will sell. They know the influence that takes place because of that. But here's a sad thing. What also took place was that it didn't have to be a famous person. So on your social media... On Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat. It just takes one person to go out there and to share something that becomes popular and that's what every kid nowadays, they measure themselves on. I have a friend of mine and I talk with him occasionally and he is a pastor. He's an ordained pastor. But if you go on to his site on Facebook, you wouldn't know that he's a pastor because literally it says that he is a public personality. He is a public person. That's what his role is. And over two and a half million people follow him. And what he does is he puts things out there so that you'll continue to follow him. And he posts those things and everyone, and that's how he keeps popular. He is a social influencer. But when you talk to him, he'll point you back to the cross. Because he knows that's the most important thing. Now, to the public, it's a little different than what he is in private. But he keeps the public out there so that he can have the opportunity to talk to them in private. Some people don't like what he does. Some people don't like his means. Some people don't like his methods. And they have every right to do so. But they also have the right to influence people within their lives for the positive. I don't like the way that he does things. I don't like the way that she says things. I don't like the things that are going on. But you know what? Instead of complaining about it and saying, oh, I'm going to do something about it. Why? Because of that circle of influence. And this gives us the opportunity to do so. This is how Jesus said it. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is John 13, 15. It says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus didn't say, this is a really good idea. Just go out and try it. Let me know how it goes. He was the example before others. And we have this throughout the Bible. Moses was the example for Joshua. Then Joshua took over. Elijah was the example for Elisha. And then Elisha took over. Paul was the example for Timothy. And then Timothy took over his own church. But here's the thing. Jesus was the example for his disciples. And then when it got a little bit difficult, it got really difficult, what did they do? They ran. But Jesus never gave up. He came back for them. 
And if you're sitting here today and you're just like, man, nobody listens to me. Nobody cares about what I have to say. Nobody really gives a rip. No one's going to listen anyway. You can sit there and hold on to all those things, but you have to remember this. Jesus said to be the example and to live the example before others. He said, do it as I have done it. Because guess what? It just takes one person to start to listen. And then two, and then five. And you are making a difference in your own circle of influence. This next verse says it like this. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Follow my example. This is Paul writing it. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And the ESV says it this way. It says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let's play a little game here. Simon says. Okay? Everyone's in. Who's all in? If you're not in, raise your hand. Not one person raised their hand. Very nice. So that means you're all in. Simon says, raise your right hand. <laughs> you're like this. Simon says, raise your left hand. Whoa, whoa, why'd you put your right hand down? Some people put the right hand down. We didn't say put the right hand down. Here we go. Let's start over. If you did it, you're out. Simon says, put your right hand up. Simon says, put your left hand up. Simon says, put your right hand in. Simon says, shake it all around. Simon says, stop shaking it. Simon says, put your right hand up. Simon says, put your left hand down. Oh, you almost dropped him. That was good. Simon says, put your right foot in. Simon says, put your butt in. All right, good. All right, put your hands down. Who, who just put their hands down? I, Simon didn't say. See, I got you. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. There was a couple times I went to drop my hands and boom, one people goes to drop their hands. Our imitation, our example should be that of Jesus. Jesus cared for people that had no one caring for him. Jesus reached out to people that didn't want to reach out, that no one else wanted to reach out to. Jesus met people where no one else wanted to meet them. At the end of the day, he loved people. Paul hated Christians. And then Jesus one day said to him, enough. Enough is enough. And then Paul changed so far that he said, I'm going to imitate Christ and I hope others will imitate Christ as I have. So here we go, folks. If we're going to be a circle of influence, enough is enough. We need to put away the complaining. We need to put away the negativity. We need to put away the despair. We need to put away all the discouragement because God has you. But we need to turn this to a, a, a portion of love and of grace and of acceptance and realize that we can influence others if we'll just love them as Jesus loved them. That's awesome. Not everyone's going to be accepting of it. Not everyone's going to want it. We had a guy yesterday that showed up and he was so angry at the beginning I waved him, he just scoffed and walked right past me because there was a disagreement about something. Like, hey, it's okay. Take 300 pumpkins with you. It's all good. It'll make it better. <laughs> but he was mad. And he was mad because there was some, uh, or some kind of misunderstanding. And, and that happens in life. But guess what? The person that misunderstanding was with said, I'll make it right. I'll do whatever I have to do to make it right. And that's what we have to do at times. At the end of the day, if that guy is still mad, that's on him. Why? Because that person that made it right was imitating what Christ would do. And everyone else had a really, really great day. And we would have loved if that guy would have had a great day. He didn't. That was his choice. Sometimes people are going to make their own choice and that is on them, but it's away from Christ. But guess what? If we're not taking the time to worship together and talk about this, if we're not accepting, if we're not sharing grace, if we're not out to influence them for Christ, what do we influence them for? Because we need to imitate a Savior that loved us just as we are. And that's awesome. That's the amazing grace. The next circle that we need to talk about is that of accountability. Let's look at these verses. We're going to start here with Romans 14, 12. It says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Let's, let's hit the pause button. Right now, right where you sit. Because Jesus come back anytime. Who wants Jesus come back? Okay? Right now. Right? Anytime. If he did, how would that conversation go with you? Between you two. Between me and him. Between you and him. How would that conversation go? And then our next thing is like, uh, yeah, how would that go for you? Right? We look at our spouse. Yeah, how would that go? Right? We want to we want to pass it off on someone else. How would your conversation with Jesus go for you? Because that is the most com important conversation that you're going to have. 
Yes, you want to have every answer. Yes, you want to know everything about it. But at the end of the day, I just ask you to love others as I have loved you. I asked you to stop long enough and recognize that I gave you a gift. Did you accept that gift? I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple question. Because see, in this circle, there's an accountability side. And your accountability, my accountability, has to be first to God. But then we also need one another. Look at this next verse. This is Galatians 6.1. It says, brothers and sisters, that's everyone here. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. So there's a time of restoration. But watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. It is so easy for us to be tempted. It is so easy for us to fall into things that pull us away from our time with God. Pull, pull us away from our time of reading with God. Pulling us away from our prayer time with God. Pull us, pulling us away from serving others. Because sadly, many times it can be because of other believers. And we need to understand that if, as we're urging one another along that this time that we come together that we need to be doing so with a mindset of grace and of love and of peace and of hope. Because that is what Jesus did. Let's read this, uh, this next verse here real quick. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Who are you sharpening? Who are you allowing to help sharpen you? Are your conversations such that if God, lo such that if God looked on, He would like, those are the conversations I want to hear. Are your conversations with God so that you're speaking with Him regularly so that you can listen for Him and He can listen for you? And are you taking the time to sharpen someone? And taking the time to allow yourself to be sharpened by someone. These words were written by Solomon, the same guy that wrote the stuff in Ecclesiastes earlier about the whole two and the three and needing the three and all that kind of stuff. If you are not being sharpened by God's word, by prayer time, by your, uh, by your choice to serve others, if you're not being sharpened in it, and if you're not being sharpened by being influenced and influencing others according to what God teaches us, and if you are not being sharpened according to the example that Jesus set for you to set others, you are getting duller every day. More and more dull all the time. And that beautiful, shiny piece of metal that was like, oh my goodness, I'm this shining example and this light before God and light before others and people can see that, all of a sudden starts to get dull and get to the point where it's not sharp at all and it just becomes kind of a metal chunk laying against a wall somewhere. And it happens in this life. And it happens in this life because we allow it to happen. And people wear us out and people wear us down. To the point where like, I don't even feel like doing anything. And you know who gets the short end of the stick every single time? Is God. Every time. We stop even thinking about influencing others so that people can see Jesus. And it's because whenever we get to the point of accountability... We feel the guilt, and yet God wants us to share the grace. If you are with someone and they are wearing you out, get away from them. Because you become more and more dull. And find someone who loves the Lord. Find someone who loves you no matter what. Find someone who's going to point you to God's Word. And find someone that is not only going to love you for who you are, but is going to accept you for who you are before God. But you need to be accountable. And you need someone to be accountable to you. And that is the way that you and I get sharper. Last circle. Circle of accountability. Last one is our circle of outreach. Yesterday we saw this. We saw the different pictures Rick had posted, posted these. Let's look at this verse. It's a Proverbs 13.20. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Okay, there's no Simon Says, just be honest. How many of you guys have fools in your lives? How many of you guys, you just know today that you're going to talk to some fool? How many of you right now are listening to some fool? 
It's okay, I can take it. <laughs> Just want to make you laugh a little bit. Make sure you're paying attention and you're all going to hell. Okay, so... John Wesley said it like this. A person must have friends or make friends for no one ever went to heaven alone. I want you to think about your family and think about your friends for a moment. Do you want them to be in heaven with you? I know some of your family members are going, well, there's a couple of them. You know, that one, I'm, yeah, no, 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 no. No one ever went to heaven alone. Do the people in your life mean enough to you that you want them to be in heaven with you? How are you influencing them? Are you accountable to them? Are they accountable to you? Are you sharing grace? Are you being accepting of them and to them? Knowing that, as you are being sharpened and they are sharpening you, that that shine comes back and it reflects Jesus. Whenever we imitate someone like Paul or someone who we know is of faith, who is imitating Jesus, who imitated his father. Jim Rohn said it this, this way, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Are they people that are uplifting? Are they people that are encouraging? Are they people that are going to urge you on in your walk of faith? So that you can go to reach those that aren't. Because if we don't want to go to heaven alone, then sooner or later we've got to have these circles. We've got to take these circles seriously. This little fundamental of our faith to say that other people matter. Because you know who they matter to? They matter to God. And you know who else matters to God? You do and I do. As believers that want and choose to live this way. You're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. When I was a youth pastor, one of the things that I shared with my kids all the time was, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Guess what? It never changes. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. If you're hanging out with people that constantly complain, you're going to constantly complain. If you're hanging out with people that need drama, you're going to constantly have drama. If you're hanging out with people that all they'd ever do is spend time on the phone, you're going to constantly spend time on your phone. If you're hanging out with people that all they do is binge watch this, all you're going to do is binge watch that. If you're hanging out with people that share their faith and talk about their faith and live their faith, you will do the same. People that spend their time wisely. People that dive into their word. People that believe that prayer is a conversation with God. People that serve others because Jesus served others. And people that take their circles of life seriously. Rick, can you show, or Jason, can you show this picture here real quick? This is how I view these circles. These are Olympic circles for those of you who don't know. The Olympics used to be such a big thing when I was growing up. Oh my goodness, it was like every four years. It was so exciting. You have the Summer and the Winter Olympics. And then someone came along and said, let's split them up into every two years. And we don't have, I mean, it, like, like basketball. Basketball was like the, the amateur guys. And we played against all the pros from the other nations. And we won many times. So every once in a while we lost. But then, then the sporting events, which was about you know, the human spirit and competing with one another, it started getting political. And we had an embargo here, and you, you didn't do your grain right, and you don't treat your people right, and all of a sudden people started boycotting, and man, we were going to win the gold medal here, but man, we, we didn't go because of this embargo and because of this. Uh, there was always something. And then they switched it to every two years, and it just lost. It was just so exciting. I just cannot even explain it, how great it was. But the spirit of the Olympics is still a spirit that thrives within each one of us. Of having this opportunity to compete sometimes with people we know, sometimes with people we don't. This is the same way when it comes to our circle of influences. They rely on one another. So take these Olympic rings. I pray that you'll be reminded about them when you see them. And remember that one ring is our circle of worship. This time that we come together. Folks, we need this time together. We need this time together to hear about God's Word and to grow in God's Word. And we need one another. It's a community of worship. 
The second ring, it has to be around that acceptance. And with that acceptance should come grace and not guilt. We all make dumb decisions. We all know people that are making dumb decisions. But we're not going to be able to get rid of those dumb decisions until we take them to God. And that's where the grace comes in. The next one is a circle of influence. How is it you are influencing people? What is your circle of influence? Are you taking what from what the great proverb writers of today are saying and the singers and the songwriters and the movies and the shows and all those other kind of things? Or are you taking it to God? And then are you reflecting it so that other people can see a God that loves you? Because they need to. The next area is accountability. i got to have someone that I'm going to talk to that I can at least bring this up. Man, I'm having a rough day and I'm doing whatever I can just to get through. And every single person I swear that I talk to today, I just want to punch them in the face with a shovel. And we laugh, but you've all felt that at some point in your life. I get in my car and all of a sudden I could rip the steering wheel off. Why could I not drive the Batmobile so I could just open up the machine guns and blow them off the road? We feel it at times. We have to be accountable to somebody to talk about those things. I'm just angry today. I'm just upset today. I'm just, I just feel like everyone's coming down to me today. I'm just lonely today. I'm just discouraged. God can handle every single one of those. How? By these circles. By coming together to worship. By being accountable. By being an influencer that's for God. Because here's the last thing. That last circle is that of outreach. We have to have a mindset and a circle of outreach. And they all rely on one another. And the foundation for them is a powerful, passionate, and personal Savior. That every question, every doubt, every fear, every struggle, He took all those away when He died on the cross for you and for me. Because here's the cool thing about it. He came back. So no matter how big your struggle is, know this. When you give this to Him, you too can come back from it. Challenge yourself to do so. Challenge yourself to influence others for a Savior that loves you just as you are. Challenge yourself to be accepting, but to bring that grace that we all need, that we all demand, but that we all should give. And let's grow together in worship. And let's grow together by serving others. Let's grow together to love others and imitate a Savior that did this for us. The praise team is going to come up. And as they come up, as we finish through these focusing on the fundamentals, my prayer is every time you see these Olympic rings, because they're going to be coming up, that you think about this time that we had together. In these five different areas when it comes to our faith. So right where you sit right now, I just want you to, I want you to take a moment. I just want you to close your eyes for a second and just talk to God. Have a conversation with them. Share them the struggles that are going on in your heart. Lift up the people that you know that are missing, that you wish you had sitting next to you, that would just take a little bit of time to be there because it means so much to you. Cast all the cares and the doubts and the struggles or whatever they might be. Tomorrow's Monday and you're already dreading it, but you haven't even enjoyed this first day of the week with Him. And look at ways that you can influence others for the cause of Christ, for God's kingdom. Because none of us want to go to heaven alone. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, God, at this time, Lord, we know everything out there says that we're lonely and we're discouraged and we have doubt and we have worry. But God, for whatever reason, you brought us here together today. This time where we can worship you together, but at the same time to have this conversation with you one-on-one. Lord, help us to never lose sight of the importance of these moments that we have. Not only with the people sitting with us, but also before you. And God, for those that are out there that we wish were with us right now. God, those that may not be hearing about your word. Lord, would you watch over them? Would you help us to reach out to them? Would you help us to influence them in such a way that they can see the acceptance and the grace that we have, but most of all, that they can see you. They can understand how much they're loved because we share that love with them. But God, challenge us today, Lord, in everything we say and everything we do to be that light.
It's tough at times. It's difficult. We're in a dark world. God, you've got this. Help us to believe that. Help us to trust in it. And Lord, if there's anyone here today, if there's anyone here today, God, that they have never taken that step to ask you into their heart, Lord, let today be that day. Let today be that day that they know that they are loved just as they are for all the things that are going on in their mind and in their heart and in their life. They can put all that away to, if they'll just trust in you. God, we love you. We thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray that we lift our voices and our hearts up to you as we take this time in worship. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all please rise.